This song is incredibly appropriate for uh, the text we're looking at today because we're taking a look at the people of Israel as they're on their way from Egypt uh, to the promised land and they're learning to fly. But they ain't got wings. And uh, we're going to just see how much that came into, came into play today. So the text today is uh, from Exodus 16. We're looking at most of this uh, chapter. And talking about it as manna and quail and loaves and fishes and rice and beans and so on and so forth. So let's just take a look at this thing. By the way, there are two kind of general schools of thought with how to do a, a teaching that pastors know about. The prevailing way that you hear lots and lots of conferences on goes something like this. Read the text, study the text, figure out that one thing that you just really want to drive home hard and develop everything toward that one thing. So everybody will walk away with that one thing. Now sometimes uh, the text lends itself to that. But other times uh, there's a more rabbinical way, a more midrash type way. Uh, and that's the way I'm employing today. This story has so much meat in it, kind of pun intended, <laughs> uh, that I can't just give you one thing. There is kind of this one prevailing point that we're going to end with that you'll see is related to all the others, but there is so much here. So here's, <laughs> here's my uh, terrible word to you. If you leave here and don't get anything out of the story, you're either asleep, <laughs> don't have a pulse, <laughs> or just are in flat out denial. Because if you are a human being, this story is going to nail you one way or another, and it's just so good. So let's take a look at it. Uh, this is the Exodus 16. So, then the whole community of Israel set out from Elim and journeyed into the wilderness of sin. Now you might think, wilderness of sin, run for your life, don't go in the wilderness of sin. This is a different word of sin altogether. It's not talking about that sin, it's talking about a region. <laughs> so don't worry about this wilderness of sin, even if you find yourself in it. Between Elim and Mount Sinai, which is where it actually is. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month. So we're looking at 45 days into their journey, right? One month after leaving the land of Egypt. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. Why? Because they're the top dogs. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Now, there's a note here that I think we need to make. I think we need to notice. And that is that anxiousness messes with us. So in the first service, we do things a little differently in that service, but basically the theme is the same. And the question I asked everybody is, how does somebody you know know that you are hungry? And so I asked the question after people milled around a little bit, said, how many of you, your stomach growls so loud they can hear from across the room? And nobody really raised their hand. I said, well, how many of you just kind of get lethargic and you just need energy? Nobody really raised, your, raised their hand. I said, how many of you get grumpy? <laughs> and all, yeah, thank you, all of the hands shoot up. Uh, Jeff Jones, who gave me that, uh, that saw for us to use here at the church, he was the first guy who I'd ever used, who I had ever heard the phrase hangry come from. And it was not recent. This was like 15 years ago or so. He was helping me do some flooring in my house. And I didn't know what hangry was until I saw it in Jeff Jones. <laughs> He'd been working hard all morning, and it was time to fill the tank. <laughs> and he let me know it. So I got a burger in him, and everything was good. But until then, it was hangry. Well, there's something here for us to learn. When people are anxious about stuff, um, we got to let them be where they are. Because stressed out people act in stressed out ways. Uh, I am sure, Nicole, when you go back uh, to Puerto Rico and you and Brian both do an EMT work, I'm sure that the people that you saw doing your line of work, they were never in perfect mental and emotional condition. But I'm guessing you saw all kinds of panic, all kinds of stress from all kinds of people around that. Why? Because that's what we should expect. And so you have people who are panicking. Uh, they're probably running out of food. They're in the wilderness where nothing is supposed to grow, where you can't sustain life. That's how they thought about wilderness. And now they're wondering, are we just going to be out here and die? And so even when they're complaining about their present state, catch this. They're talking about how wonderful it was in Egypt, kind of forgetting what came along with all that bread and pots of meat. Slavery, harsh, harsh slavery. The kind of a slavery that was so oppressive that they needed to be taken out of it. And God helped them do that. So 
I tell you that to look for it in other people, but then also to be aware of it yourself. Because maybe, just maybe, if you and I go into our days remembering that stressful people act in stressed out ways, and sometimes we are that stressed out person, it might just help us tone ourselves down. So if it's getting to 11.30, now I know I'm good with you guys today because I fed you, so you're going to be really nice to me <laughs> for the rest of the service, but maybe tomorrow they don't provide breakfast for you, and so you go, and around 11.30, you start to get a little bit grumpy with the people in your life. Well, maybe you remember today, and you're like, okay, just hold on. I just need some food, and I'm not going to act as grumpy as my body tells me I should. So that's the first thing, is to recognize that anxiousness messes with us and the question is, is how does it mess with the hungry travelers, knowing that you are one of those travelers? Okay, the story continues. Then the Lord said to Moses, look, look. He's excited. This is God speaking. Look, I'm, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they will gather food, and when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. The note I want you to see here is that God didn't scold people for their crying out. There's some other crying out that's going to come, which they need to be held accountable for, but not this one. This one, they're just hangry people. And they're upset, and they're fearful, and God recognizes that in them. And instead of adding to their stress, saying, well, you bunch of morons, didn't you? Did you have already forgotten that cool trick I pulled off with the Red Sea? He doesn't do that. Instead... He meets their aggravation and their anxiousness with grace. Oh, you're hungry, of course. Well, look what I'm going to do for you. I can't wait to meet your need <laughs> with what I can provide. That's the attitude of God. And if we are God followers, that has to be our attitude then. Do you, do you see? So the take home for you so far is one, you can be that hangry person who acts stressed out. So be aware of that so that you might not be as much. But two, when you meet people who are so stressed out and are acting that way, you have a choice how to respond. You can either instigate more fire, you can either make it worse by your behavior, or you can seek to meet it with grace and understand what's going on so that you can do something differently. God did. Uh, God didn't scold the people. All right, the story continues. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, by evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard. Everybody, anytime you see that word, just uh, I'm going to make you say it. So everybody say the word heard. heard. Excellent. So let's just start that sentence over. In the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has your complaints, which are against him, not against us. What have we done that you should complain about us? Then Moses added, the Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning. For he has, oh, you guys are lame. Let's try that again. Meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning, for he has, thank you, all your complaints against him. What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. Then Moses said to Aaron, announce this to the entire community of Israel. Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has, your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness. There they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have the Israelites complaints now tell them in the evening you will not you will have eat meat to eat and in the morning you have all the bread you want then you will know that I am the Lord your God so on the next slide here's the note being heard matters being heard matters being heard matters being heard matters why did I give it to you four times because isn't it interesting that the way this is recorded for us by the writers who put this uh, probably down on, on parchment hundreds of years after the fact that they wanted to, us to see in just a few verses that God heard. Because that's the character and nature of God. Being heard matters. As to everybody, but especially people who are under duress. And so the question is, when we deal with stressed people, how well do we communicate that we hear them? And I want to tell you that... Um, for all of our communication and technology to communicate, I think we do a really lousy job in our present culture actually listening and hearing. Now, you may not know this, but as a pastor, that makes me a professional nice guy. Did you know that? I'm not very good at that part of my job, but I'm working on it. But you know what I've learned? Um, 
is that because, because I am a pastor, and I actually care about you, <laughs> and I care about people in general, I, I'm very curious, and so I ask a lot of questions of people. And when I ask questions of people, you know what? I actually want to know what the answer is. Which means that when I ask you how you're doing, and how do you like your job, and how's your world going, it means I'm actually wanting to know what's going to come out of your mouth. I'm not already formulating what I'm going to say next after you get done talking so I can have the mic again. It's kind of ironic that the guy that has a mic for 40 minutes every week. <laughs> but anyway, other than that, <laughs> you have to listen to me now, don't you? You know what I've noticed? Is that when I do lunch or coffee with somebody and my mission is just to get to know them, one of us ends up having a hot meal. And it's me. Because I'm the one that's asking the questions. And what I've discovered is, is very few people actually get somebody in front of them who ask questions and want to hear the answer. You ever notice that? And so it doesn't surprise me anymore when people can do a monologue for half an hour, which I'm cool with. Because nobody else does. And so here we have God who is with a whiny, complainy, necessarily group. They're upset, they're stressed out, they're hungry. And God makes sure that it is communicated that God has heard them. So not only do we learn something from God's character about how we treat people in their stress, we don't add to their stress, we do something to meet their stress and bring more shalom where that stress is disturbing shalom. But now we also go the next step and we do whatever we can to make sure they know that we have actually heard them, which often means we have to re-communicate what we just heard them say. So you tell me your work is terrible? Is that what, I'm hearing that your work is really stressful. So, you're, so you went and got that news from the doctor yesterday that was just really disheartening. So your relationship with your spouse is not where it wants to be. Is that what's happening? These are ways to pair it back to communicate. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you would be game for being the shalom people in the world, where everybody's busy talking and not too many people are doing a good job listening. And I wonder how much good just that would do. All right, story continues. That evening, vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, it's the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household uh, should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. This is two quarts, just so you have a reference there. And this is manna in there. All right. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of, it, some of it until morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry with them. So the note on this is the bread of God cannot be hoarded. And the question with that is, which faith orders your steps, Egypt's or Israel's? Because at this point, some of them were operating under Egypt's operating system where you have to hoard as much as you can because you don't know what's coming tomorrow. And so you better hold on tight to as much as you possibly can because you never know. You gotta wait for that rainy day. You gotta wait for the other shoe to drop. So make sure you keep more than you really need because you're just not sure about tomorrow. But the way that God is trying to reshape their thinking to help them learn to fly in a different way, to change their operating system to say, I'm gonna give you what you need I'm going to give you just enough, and you learn to live with enough. Gandhi, uh, related to this way of thinking, said, the world has enough for everyone's need, but there is never enough for everyone's greed. And Jesus, long before Gandhi, uh, caught on to this. He says, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and mammon, and mammon refers to stuff, money, things. 
And we have that before us. Two different ways to think. There's a biblical scholar named Leander Keck. He says it this way. They want to establish a surplus, these Israelites, to develop a zone of self-sufficiency. The people in the wilderness immediately try to replicate the ways of Egypt by storing up and hoarding out of anxiety and greed. However, this bread, bread of another kind given by God, cannot be stored up. The narrator takes pains to underscore that stored, that stored up surplus bread is useless. Bread that reflects self-sufficient anxiety and greed will have no food value for Israel, so that the bread of disobedience breeds worms, turns sour, and melts. It's an interesting insight. But you know what? It's not just about bread. Because we don't have much manna around anymore. We're not even exactly sure what that ever looked like or was. It's just part of the story. But you know what? There's a different substance that has the same experience and same result. So I was once with this guy. Spent an afternoon with him and have a very interesting conversation. As I was getting to know him, I discovered pretty quick that this guy was really well versed in the scriptures. I mean, he even showed me his worn out Bible with lots and lots of highlights in it. One that he'd been going through for years. And then he told me a little bit about his day, about how he had quiet time in the morning to do some meditation and prayer, and how most of the day he would listen to, um, to uh, radio preachers uh, all day long just to fill himself up with the goodness of God. And so I was like, wow, that's okay. That's, that's interesting. That's, that's something. The more he talked, though, the more curiosity developed in me. Because when he would talk about his neighbors, none of it was good. Apparently, this guy lives with the worst community in the world. <laughs> I mean, nobody was nice to him, and nobody was treating him well at all. I couldn't believe it, this poor guy. And then he started to talk about the world at large, and how awful that person was, and that president was, and that congressperson, and this leader, and that leader, and that preacher, and blah, blah, blah. And everything that was coming out of this guy was just negative. It was awful. And I started to think about this passage, the manna from heaven, about how you can't hold on to it. You can't store it up or else it, it starts to just stink and grow maggots and stuff. And so he was asking me for help. And so <laughs> this is the part where you realize I have some work to do on my delivery. But So he asked me, and it was a place where he really wanted to know what I thought. And so I said, well, man, I think I know the problem. I think you're constipated. <laughs> well, he wasn't real excited to hear that. And I said, no, I don't even talk. I'm not talking about your bathroom tendencies here. But here's what I'm seeing, man. Uh, you are full up to the neck with understanding about the love and the grace of God, but you are not letting any of that out. You, it's not flowing out, and it is, it is rotting like leftover manna in you. And I think that's how it really works. I think if you try to learn book smart, how to be loving and graceful, and you've got it all figured out, but you never actually let it out, I think it rots. And I think it rots you. And so I'm wondering if we struggle with our grumpiness sometimes as Christian people and all we can think about is negative thoughts about all those awful people out there doing terrible things in the world I wonder if it's time we start I don't know releasing a little bit of love and actually practicing what we've been learning for so long so if you're constipated <laughs> you've got a solution now maybe it's time to actually start working this out Jeff Jones um, told me there's a, there's a recovery a statement something like the only thing worth keeping is that which you are giving away or the only thing you can keep is that which you give away and that has to do with love the only way you grow in love is by loving other people otherwise it's just manna that will rot okay we continue the story after this the people gathered uh, the food morning by morning each family according to its need and as the sun became hot the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared on the sixth day they gathered twice as much as usual four quarts for each person instead of two then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, well, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left for tomorrow. 
So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good, without maggots or odor. Moses said, Eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There, you, there will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is for the Sabbath. There will be no food on the ground that day. Now, some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. The Lord asked Moses, How long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. So the note here is that Sabbath is a gift to protect, not a law that enslaves. And the question is, how are you protecting Sabbath in your life? The grocery stores are open today. I grew up in a town in uh, Kansas, a small town, uh, where Sabbath law was still on the books. And except for a couple of gas stations on the edge of town by the freeway, everything in town was closed. You couldn't buy anything. Tough luck if you didn't get your groceries the day before. You know, it was a little annoying as a kid at that time when I wanted to go get a toy or whatever, and I couldn't get it. But, you know, now in retrospect, not that, not that legalizing that is necessarily the way to go. That always backfires, but there are some smarts to that. There are some smarts to building in structure so that there are certain things you don't do that you set aside to just have a sacred time where you're not doing work, you're not doing all your work email, you're just chilling. You know, this weekend was a chill weekend for my wife and I. We haven't had a chill weekend for a while, just different things going on. And I gotta tell you, it was pretty nice to just chill. <laughs> we do it pretty well, actually. Just being lazy, just having fun, just resting, just goofing off. And you know what? You need that. We need that. And I'm wondering if you've ordered your life, structured your life so that that can happen for you. So it's just food for thought. Knowing next weekend's coming, uh, how can you make that Saturday or Sunday or whatever that day is for you? It's not tied to a particular day. But how can you make it so that one day is just there for you to breathe? Because that's God's gift to you. That's God's gift to you. You become more filled with shalom when you do that. Okay, we're in the final stretch here, folks. So the Israelites called the food manna. Literally, uh, the Hebrew word manna translates, what is it? <laughs> That's what it is. They don't know what it's called, so what is it? It reminds me of a lot of food I had in college, actually. Uh, so it was, it was white like coriander seed, and it tasted like honey wafers. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Fill a two-quart container with manna, just like this one, to preserve it for your descendants. Then later generations will be able to see the food I gave you in the wilderness when I set, it, when I set you free from Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, Get a jar and fill it with two quarts of manna. Then put it in, the, in a sacred place before the Lord to preserve it for all future generations. Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He eventually placed it in the Ark of the Covenant in front of the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. So the people of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they arrived at the land where they would settle. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So passing on the story matters. And so they had their jar of manna, which they kept in the Ark of the Covenant, which if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark is in Washington, D.C. somewhere in the Smithsonian Archives. Anyway, I was able to get this out on loan, so here it is for you to look at. And the reason we do that is because it reminds us of the story, right? It reminds us of what happened because we need to re be reminded of this very different way that God operated in the world that is not like the world. And so my question for you is, how are you passing on this, this story? Because passing on the story matters. That's why the children's ministry that we do here it matters, and we need an all-hands-on-deck kind of approach to it to raise the bar of it because it matters that much. At least this could be one space where they come and hear the story. Because even our own, in our own families, in our business, we might not remember how to communicate that well to the children who don't know the story. Now, my, my college roommate was sort of technically a Christian, at least that's what he would say, 
But my very first uh, spring break came around, and I would say, well, what are you going to do for spring break? And I said, well, I'm just going to go home and hang out. What are you doing? Well, I know on, uh, on Sunday we're going to be going to church because it's Easter and everything. And his quest, first question out of his mouth was, this is a guy who kind of grew up in church all his life. He says, what is Easter anyway? So we have a hard time letting the story have life. How are you doing that? How, what reminders do you have in place to remind you of the story that we're a part of that informs everything we do because it is not in existence, in existence in the world's operating system. The ways of humility, the ways of shalom, those are foreign language pieces. So how are these things in front of you and a part of you so that you can live in them? There are some bonus themes on the next uh, thing I want to share with you. Here are the bonus themes. Uh, so note that God transformed the wilderness and still does. This is kind of the crazy part. The people looked around and said, we are in a place of death. There's no way we're going to live in this place of death. And yet God delivered in the place of death. And so my question is, are we stuck in an apparently dead wilderness? And some of you are. And I know some of you are. Because you're going through hell in your life for whatever reason, a physical thing, an emotional thing, death of a loved one, etc. And sometimes when we're in those spaces, we wonder if God is present at all. And here's what I want to tell you. Sometimes God is most present in the crisis, in the wilderness time. That's when we are able to see God and hear God sometimes most clearly uh, because we don't have the distraction of the land of Goshen around us. And if you need help unpacking that, trying to figure out how in the world is God in the mix in this wilderness period of your life, well, I'm pretty good at helping you figure that out. So set up a time and let's talk. And I'll help you see that even in this dark time, there's power in it because God is there. And God will get you through this thing. In fact... <laughs> those darkest times become our most powerful life-changing moments in our lives. And I don't want you to miss out. So let me know how I can help. Another note, Jesus fed 5,000 plus uh, from next to nothing. Um, this is recorded in three of the Gospels that he did it twice. And then in the Gospel of John, he picks it up and, and mentions that it happened. So I'm wondering if you were in the crowd that day and you grew up hearing about this jar of manna that's in the Ark of the Covenant. And now you're sitting here and listen to this guy who seems to be anointed of God doing incredible things. And all of a sudden, food in abundance is before you from virtually nothing as the story goes. What dots are you going to connect? So the earliest people who heard Jesus, who were part of that story, who remembered that story, they're saying, just like God provided manna in the wilderness, so we are seeing God do it again through the person of Jesus. Don't miss it. Don't miss what God is saying through this Jesus. And that was part of the big point. And then also, um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, referenced this as well. And so I want to read you just what he had to say, um, because the very last line of this passage and uh, his letter to the Corinthians, uh, he, he quotes the manna story. So this is what he says to this church. And it has to do with our, our money and sharing and stuff. He says, I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. 